happy to be here to share our work and I, I just hope that we can really uh, have a good conversation today. I'm not sure about many of your backgrounds and uh, single subject analyses, so uh, I'm going to ask for a little bit of interaction as we go. Just let me know if I need to go into more detail I'll, and or uh, save more time to talk about results and things like that. So I'll ask for a little show of hands as we go through and try and make this as interactive as possible in such a large forum. So uh, first, just to state our problem, we've got a group of patients, they all have individual genetic backgrounds with the same phenotype, trait, or disease. And yet, we treat many of these patients the same. So we, we have treatments that are developed across average of patients, and, and we have drug targets based in this manner. And yet, we, we really want to treat every single patient a, as we would if we could address their true individuality, if, if that is possible. So that's one of the main goals of precision medicine. So. One way to look at this is, is to take a look at their individual gene expression, what their transcriptome, which allows us to see uh, multiple scales of biology, uh, genetics, epigenetics, and so forth. So what we're after with, with this problem today is the personal transcriptome profile. So what can we gain from looking at a profile like this? Is it meaningful? Is it too variable? Is it too noisy? How can we use this? So that, this is uh, the main question today, and this is very important in, in lots of diseases. Today I'm talking about breast cancer in particular, but in orphan and rare diseases, uh, the personal transcriptome profile might be the best you can do. So this is an important application. So I'm going to walk you through a traditional uh, uh, discussion of a paper, background method, results discussion, and leave you with a take-home message. I know you're going to see lots of talks. We only have 20 minutes, so I just if there's one thing to remember, what we've developed is a new and effective method for scoring gene sets within a single patient. So that's the main goal of all this work uh, that we're doing, and we show you some ways that it's useful and, and why it's uh, an improvement on existing methods. So first, uh, how many people have seen gene set analysis? Please raise your hands if you've seen it. So many people have seen that. So traditionally, gene set enrichment analysis or differential expression of genes followed by enrichment, those are two of the main methods. So many people are familiar with that. We're going to use that in our methods as well. It, you know, as you know, might know already, it affords a, a reduction in dimension, um, adds interpretability, and single uh, molecule biomark biomarkers aren't as reliable as we'd like. So that's why we prefer to look at the gene set level. In addition, to translate that to the clinical practice, it's very important to have those uh, in, uh, easily interpretable uh, meanings for those sets of genes rather than 30,000 genes that have lots of roles. Uh, secondly, what about single subject transcriptomes? How many people have seen single subject analyses? So we got three or four. So you, you guys are uh, have a familiar, and our work is uh, largely working with that over the past few years. So I'll, I'll give a little more background on that, a little less on the gene set analysis. So instrumental prior work, uh, like I said, many people are familiar with this. I'm not going to go into detail, but it is instrumental and great work, and our work follows and builds on, on these type of ana analyses. One you may be not familiar of uh, is the functional analysis of individual microarray expression, or FAME, that our lab developed in, in 2012, and that is a single subject transcriptome analysis using the same type of ideas of gene set analysis. So let's just walk through that a little bit more. Uh, imagine you have an individual, they, they are afflicted with a disease or they have a, a phenotype of interest, and we measure the gene expression. Now you can look at a pathway level signature rather than just the gene expression, and what that can show is if a certain pathway is overexpressed or underexpressed in comparison to other gene sets. So that's, that's really the idea, it's a, it's a competitive type test. Is this one pathway overexpressed or not? And we have scoring, and it turns out these scores are actually really important. They've predicted head and neck cancer survivor, survival and uh, some other important applications. So FAME is, is some work that we did. Uh, building on that, we said, why not use two samples from one patient? And that allows us to look at dynamic mRNA expression changes. So what is it you gain from this? Instead of just seeing an over or under expression from a single sample, we actually get to see a pathway dysregulation metric. So we can say, is this pathway up or down regulated uh, comparing two samples? And two samples you might look at could be, you know, application like taking a sample yesterday and then uh, the day after a treatment, or it could be something like tumor or non-tumor. So these are typical uh, paired situations. 
our first, our first uh, framework that we used was N of 1 pathways, pathways because of the gene sets and N of 1 because it comes from one patient. And we used a Wilcoxon signed rank statistic to assess pathway dysregulation. Now this, this worked well in several situations such as lung cancer, uh, viral, uh, and predicting viral response. Uh, but it didn't give us a true uh, uh, metric of clinically relevant uh, pathway dysregulation. So it, it was a, basically just a, a signed rank statistic, so as you know, has very little meaning to work with. So a clinician may not be understand what, what can you do with this statistic. And so we developed in the method that I'm talking about today, uh, the N1 pathways Mahalanobis distance or MD method. And we, this actually gives you a metric that's interpretable on the scale of biology, as well as being able to quantify this pathway dysregulation. So that's the big insight from the work I'm going to be presenting today. All right, next, uh, I want to talk about the method itself and how we developed it. So you've got uh, two, two pairs of samples. You've got the entire transcriptome, or it can be more targeted. You're then going to look at the pathway uh, of interest. So you just filter down to your pathway of interest. And you can look at the bivariate relationship between the two samples. So again, a typical situation would be non-tumor and tumor samples. And on the log-log scale, it's, it's roughly linear. And you're really trying to just understand what are differences on the gene level and then the pathway level here. So if you look at that diagonal line, that's just going to be the... Let's see if I can get this working here. If you look at this... Uh, this line, diagonal line, that's equal expression. And we look at deviations from equality, and that lets us know uh, how far we, one sample is from another on a gene-by-gene gene basis. So zooming into this picture, you can see that you have lots of little distances to this line. So here comes in the, the notion of, of distance. And if you look in the Euclidean space, it's just a log fold change. So it's a very well-known quantity. If you actually use the uh, scaled Euclidean distance, which is Mahalanobis distance, how many people are familiar with Mahalanobis distance? Okay, yeah, so it's been around for a while. It just, it, 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 within the pathway, it's constant. It's going to account for the covariance variance structure. And it, we, what we looked at it, uh, is it actually has some performance gains and it just incorporates more information that we have from our sample, or limited information since we only have two samples. So again, really this, this quantity here is just a log fold change. And then here is a scaling, and that's the Mahalanobis distance. That's the, the impact of bringing that information in. So each one of these genes, J, they have these distances, and it's going to be a signed distance. It's going to be either positive or negative for under or over expression within the two samples. Summarizing this across the, the entire pathway, you get an arithmetic mean. And this is the clinically relevant metric is what we're terming this because it's really just an adjusted pathway level fold change. So that's all, that's all we have. For every pathway, we're giving you this clinically relevant metric, and it, it summarizes the entire pathway's dysregulation. And you can see that this pathway it looks like it's under-regulated under or down-regulated. However, as you know, these things can be pretty noisy, and as the keynote today pointed out, you've got to always you know, suspect that your, your data are trying to fool you. So what protection do we have against that? So what we do is we boot, bootstrap within the sample and just get lots of these clinically relevant metrics. And what we're going to do is look at the distribution of those clinically relevant metrics, all those D bar stars, and just say, how certain are we, are, are we that this pathway is dysregulated? And so what we, our criterion is actually that the entire pathway does not overlap the origin at all. Now, this is a little non-standard. You may say, why not just use like a tail probability or something like that? So we're trying to meet that balance between statistical significance and biological significance here. So that's, that's why we have such a strict criteria that we've imposed. So any overlap at all, we're saying that pathway is not dysregulated. And so for this, we have lots of evidence that it's downregulated. However, it, it doesn't meet our criterion. So it's pretty strict. So this is just one example. Now walking through, what can you do with these clinically relevant metrics? Yeah, two results is all I'm going to share with you today. And the first is going to be that these MD scores actually predict survival in breast cancer. So we looked at 80 patients from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, they had normal and tum tumor samples. And we looked at 3,000 of the uh, gene ontology, biological processes, pathway definitions. And about 2,000 of these pathways were found dysregulated in at least one patient. So you've got a lot of dysregulation that it can vary from uh, only 19 pathways for a patient and up to 1,000 per patient. So you've got a, a lot of variability from patient to patient. So not to overlook any of those signals, we just kept uh, 2,000 of the pathway scores, one that was dysregulated in at least one patient. 
And you can imagine this is just a matrix of 80 patients and 2,000 pathway scores. They're all clinically relevant metrics. And we just performed unsupervised clustering to get two distinct clus clusters of patients with, with very different survival curves. So that, that's one thing. It's biologically relevant, and you can do this when you do cross-patient analyses. Another is that it outperforms our previous work of MD um, over Will Coxon approach to N of 1 pathways. I'm going to describe a simulation with you just briefly. Imagine that we created two synthetic gene sets, two pairs of samples, and let's say they have 200 genes within that, set, that pathway. We inject a full change of 10,000, uh, or I'm sorry, 10 percent of the genes get a full change injected. And you can imagine this on a, on a plot where you've got lots of different, different gene uh, set sizes and a ratio of genes deregulated. And you can imagine that one point I just described as being right here in this contour plot. So if you look at this color scheme that we have, the darker the color, the more often we miss calling that pathway dysregulated. So all these pathways, except for when you have zero ratio of genes dysregulated, sh should be found by our method, depending on how sensitive our methods are. So you can see when there's a very small uh, ratio of genes dysregulated, or, or the pathway is smaller, it's going to be harder to find that pathway is dysregulated. Now, looking at that curve that we've indicated of 0.2, that's a false negative rate of 0.2. So anything above that is a proxy for 80% power. So you can see in many situations, our, our, our methods are able to detect this pathway as being dysregulated. If you want to quantify that as over all these simulation settings, it's about 0.81 of the si simulation uh, uh, scenarios where we obtained 80% power. So that's the area above that curve. So zooming in on, uh, we injected just a full change of two into a percentage of genes, and we're comparing MD to Will Coxon, our previous method. You can see just by looking at the red area that MD is more powerful. And looking across full change of four, this trend is, is improved even more. And looking at those areas above the curve, those metrics also support that conclusion. So we have a more powerful method now. And false positives were not increased since we had such a strict criteria that we discussed earlier during the bootstrap. So quickly, some limitations of MD and, and just a method comparison for other traditional gene set analysis. First, a pathway that's just discordantly dysregulated, meaning that genes are up and down and the pathway is just kind of out of control. We're never, never going to detect that. The pathway needs to be all up expressed or down expressed uh, compared to that baseline. So we won't detect this scenario. Further, it's computationally expensive. Do 3,000 pathways, it could take up to three hours to get enough bootstrap reps for each pathway. However, uh, a couple of hundred pathways you can do on the order of a minute or so. Just doing a quick comparison, for single subject transcriptome analyses, our methods are, are pretty unique, and the ones that I'm indicating, these three columns, are, are from our lab. And N1 Pathways MD now produces clinically relevant metrics. It can actually analyze paired and unpaired samples. Uh, we go into detail in the paper about that. And then it, we, can, we can do some uh, things that, that uh, gene set enrichment analysis and differential expression of genes followed by enrichment just cannot do because they're not designed to do this type of thing. So uh, our methods are pretty unique in, in this domain. So finally, just to, just to give you a take-home message, we developed a new and effective method for scoring genes within a single patient. In order to get at the personal transcriptome profile, we've presented one solution. We think those are important implications. We want to make it possible, just as going to the, to the physician and getting you know, your blood count or your temperature uh, measured, you can go in there and get your transcriptome measured, give the, the physician something useful and easy to understand to make better treatment plans and inform uh, clinical decisions. We have software we invite you to come try uh, in Java and R at lucialab.org. Uh, finally, I'd like to, to acknowledge my team. I, I can't uh, express gratitude enough for their hard work, and I'm, I feel grateful to be here to represent them today and their hard work and efforts, especially Dr. Eve Lucier and Dr. Walter Pigors. Uh, finally, here's our, our uh, rather detailed title again, and with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thanks for your talk. I think it's a great uh, thing to work with single sample methods. Uh, did you do any comparisons against um, multi-sample methods, either with simulations or in real data? 
yes, we, we looked at that. Uh, in our first paper, NM1 Pathways, uh, with the Wilcoxon approach, we, we did uh, many comparisons against traditional methods, so we didn't focus on this work as much, so I invite you to check out that. But uh, we showed that we had great power to make uh, distinctions and detections in comparison to the traditional methods, especially when they're in, in low sample situations, because you can see they might be a little underpowered there. In, in particular, in the current work, we looked at some ability with just a sample size of, of two or three in each group compared to gene set enrichment analysis, and, and we performed pretty well in comparison. I may have missed this part, but um, can it be applied to RNA-seq or microarray data, or is it one or the other? G any gene expression uh, analysis would be fine, yes. Okay, thanks. Yep, you're welcome. I'm sorry? Yes, yes, we have. Yeah, especially we looked at, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, we have. We looked at uh, between especially the diametric extreme patients, which maybe uh, had death of disease in less than two and a half years compared to disease-free after four years. And we looked at a comparison of their scores, and there was signal there to uh, discriminate those two groups. Very nice approach. I'm wondering uh, if you have a small sample size, say um, uh, less than uh, 20 or 30 patients, because this is nice because you're based on individual sample instead of like a, a group. So how would this perform when you're doing the clustering with like say 20, 30 patients, say they have two subtypes? Uh, you'll find trends. It's very hard to get significance between, you know, distinct Kaplan-Meier estimates, but you'll, you'll see trends there. And depending on the, on the cancer, uh, in our previous work, lung, lung cancer, it actually had three groups with a heterogeneous group in the middle. Uh, and so it just depends on the data set. It's, it's hard to find a consistent result every time. So I guess then this is the same as like population-based approach, even though you're doing uh, one sample, uh, you know, that's a concept here, it's still you, you, you have like a larger group, then you have better prediction clustering, right? Right, yeah, when you look at the cross-patient analyses, just to make, ensure that there's biological signals. So yeah, you're still limited by sample size in that respect. Mm, okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. <laughs>